because permaculture is the most holistic integrated systems design tool in the world. It's a mouthful. So it's the most holistic integrated systems design tool or ecosystem design tool in the world. It's, it gives us the ability to think of everything. We're going to leave stuff out. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to learn from mistakes. There's a whole feedback loop that's incorporated. But it gets us talking broadly enough that we can actually address a lot of problems before we act. That we can put in the observation and we can learn from experience. There are a lot of people, you know, generations before us, that we know handled a lot of these problems and lived really well. And now we have access to technology and we can even improve on some of the systems that they had. So it's you know thinking about how things were done effectively in a lower energy past, thinking about how indigenous cultures have dealt with a lot of these problems and worked more cooperatively with nature than we are now. The ethics and principles. Uh, when Bill and David, I'm sure there were lots of interesting conversations between Bill and David when they first were putting this together. It would have loved to have been a fly on the wall. But when they were first putting it together, they said, okay, this is the theory. How are we going to share this with people? And they decided that what they needed was three really clear core ethics. And the three ethics, earth care, you can think about good being a good steward, picture Earth Day every day, you know, that type of thing. So being a good steward of the planet, being a participant, thinking about your impact. But they go beyond and they challenge you and your designs to think about healing damage that's been done. So we could refer to it as regeneration. So trying to not only be a better steward of your yard or your churchyard or your community, but also to actually help make it improve from you know past damage. People care is while we're doing that, we don't want to we want to make sure we're not stepping on other people's toes, we're not stepping on their rights, we're not stepping on you know their right livelihood in the world. And that might be people that are building things that we never see who are in other parts of the country or other parts of the world. So social justice issues and other environmental issues. It might be people that are our descendants that we can't see that are going to be stuck dealing with our problems that we've left behind. Um, so thinking about that social component and also knowing to go to people and help them create the solutions that they need for their problems to meet their needs. And my favorite is fair share. Fair share is about knowing what to take, how much do I want to consume. My car is not really running. He did say that. Um, so knowing how much I want to take, but also what can I give back. So tonight's my fair share. I'm done for the month. Um, so what can I give back? It's all, we call it share the surplus. So do I have time? Do I have knowledge? Do I have energy? Do I have money? They always use money. They're a nonprofit. I'll try to plug that a couple times. Um, so you can help them buy trees and do the good work that they're doing, which is going to spread. It's going to spread like a really positive virus. So fair share is that ethic, share the surplus. Those are three great ethics. And when I have a student at the end of a course, we have them do a permaculture design of their property, and they get up, and they've been listening to us and having these really deep conversations. Now they have to show that they actually know what we were talking about <laughs> and that they really understood the, the deep conversations we had, and they actually applied that to their own lives. Those three ethics are helpful. We can make sure that we're not seeing them kind of break the ethics in their design and in the way that they're presenting everything. But it's not enough for the design. So there are a series of different principles. This list of principles comes from David Holmgren. Um, Bill Mollison has a crazy list of principles. It's like 50-something principles. They're, some of them are really, really brilliant. And then some sound just like another one. So I kind of get like halfway through, and I'm looping around, and I get confused. So I go back to this one. This one I understand. So. What this gives us is it, we're not looking to necessarily hit every single one of these principles in the design, but we're looking to hit a, a, quite a few of them. We're looking to be meeting multiple needs in the design and knowing that it's being reinforced, that it's really thoughtful, ecological design. And I'll run through each of these, so you'll have a chance to really understand them. So this is where we come in. How did I become involved in permaculture? Um, so we, my wife and I, we're new home buyer, new home owners, and I was working for the state of New Hampshire at the time as a planner. And I was really interested in sustainability. And I wanted to make the best sustainable decisions I could as a homeowner and as a planner working with communities. And I kept finding systems that were available that had really neat parts but were missing a whole thing, like energy was missing or the economy, like actually making it work for people financially was missing. I kept getting drawn back to permaculture. So when we purchased a second home, 
we decided that we were you know, starting a family and we decided to intentionally move in town. We're going to be in town. We're going to have a small transportation footprint. We're going to start growing some of our own food. We'll never be self-sufficient on this site. We know that we won't. But we're going to have a network of people around us who will help us be self-sufficient. We move into a half-acre site in town location. We have a child, and we're trying to understand what's going on in the property, and we have a second child. So we want to understand, what do we want to get out of this? What's this property been used for in the past? Where is it wet seasonally? What would grow here if I didn't mow the grass? Because I really don't like mowing grass. My father one knows I don't like mowing grass. So I don't want to mow the grass. I think there are better uses for, for the yard for us. It's not that it's going to be easier. Um, so we were trying to figure all this out. And that's where observation comes in. If we didn't spend that first you know, year, year and a half, you know, doing the things that needs to happen in the house, but really kind of looking at the big picture and getting to know where we were, we wouldn't know that there are areas that are seasonally wet. We wouldn't know that there used to be a horse on this property. There used to be chickens on this property. It used to be part of a much larger property, as you would imagine. Um, we wouldn't know the history of this hillside, that it had been a ski area that's incredibly wet uphill from us, that there are different resources, that there used to be a well outside the window of my dining room. That I've always been a depression to me. That's because it was a well, and it was filled in. I mean, I didn't know that type of information. So that was really helpful. As we started to dial in what we wanted to get out of it, food production. That was one of the things we wanted to do, and it was a relatively inexpensive thing for us to get out there and do something called sheet mulching, which we can talk a little bit more about, but to basically go in and start to create soil on top of what was lawn. Not to plow it, not to till it, not to do double digging, just to sheet mulch it and to add soil fertility and to break every rule about sheet mulching and like it was grass one day and a week later, you know, we had plants in it. Um, and it made it a little harder the first year, but it worked. So over time, we figured out that food production was important, but we realized it snows some years in New Hampshire, and we were trying to grow food outside. We actually knew that it was going to snow. We were growing food in cold frames. In cold frames, you have to like bend over, and that's really hard. It's going to be harder for me in a few years. And then you have to shovel the snow off of them, and then they create a pile, which creates a shadow, so now they're not actually getting any light. So they're doing a lot of work. So we built a greenhouse. And we never could have known to put this timber frame greenhouse, which is also a shed and a chicken coop and a cool place for a hammock, we never could have known to put it there until we knew where the sun angles were throughout the year and what other things we want to do on the property and how it would work in, co in um, cooperation with the house, with the water on the site, and with the existing garden. So that all took observation. It's a long way to say, make sure you do your observation. Um, the second is catching and storing energy, and there are a lot of different ways we can do this. Um, for a lot of us, we might think about renewable energy. We might think about how can I be away at work during the day and have the sun shine down on my property and fill batteries full of energy so when I come home I can watch American Idol or you know, talk on the phone or do something like that. So solar energy does that. It's capturing a renewable resource and storing it through the use of technology so that we can use it at a later time. We can think about food production. We can think about food that we grow and that we store as capturing and storing energy. If you take a, a pumpkin out of your root cellar in February, there's a lot of stored energy there, you know, from the soil and from the sun. Um, this is a cold frame. So for those of you that couldn't picture me bending over and cutting greens, this is a cold frame in New Hampshire on Christmas Eve, years ago. But these are greens that are willing to freeze at night and are willing to thaw out and be cut the next day. And so that takes advantage of a few pieces of, of um, timber and some old windows from the transfer station and the sun coming out and creating this little microclimate, this rich microclimate, which is going to allow the plants to continue. The third principle is obtaining a yield. And you'll notice for each of these there's an icon, kind of a nifty little icon that helps you remember, like, oh, yield might be food. Mm -hmm. And if we're not going to get something out of it, if we can't meet our needs for shelter and food and love and companionship and all that, we're not going to continue to be able to work as hard as we want to. We have to be thinking about the human needs as well. And the human need might be having a place that's comfortable on a cold day, that's going to be warm, where you can garden, where we'll start in a couple weeks growing our greens for the spring. Mm -hmm.